Today I'm going to talk about a new toy I got, and this is the Scut 818-3 kiln. So I'm going to tell you about the kiln itself and what it takes to get it all set up. And also I'm going to do a bisque firing, so I'll show you what goes into that. So here we go. Okay, this is the Scut 818-3 kiln. The dash 3 stands for the thickness of the fire brick here. This fire brick is three inches thick. Uh, the standard is, I believe, two and a half. The little bit thicker brick is a fairly inexpensive option and it also helps your pottery cool a little uh, slower, which is good for a lot of your glazes and stuff and also maybe to keep your pottery cracking from cracking and that sort of thing. Uh, I bought this kiln with a the standard control pad that's this thing right here you can get one that's like a touch screen digital type that's about a 250 dollars option the benefit of that option is it gives you finer controls on your firing you can build programs and have uh your your firing ramp up in temperature at a certain rate or slow down at a certain rate so finer controls i'm a hobby potter um this this um, controller uh, does everything that I need to do and uh, I didn't see a reason for that upgrade. One upgrade that I did get is I bought a furniture kit. It's about a $250, uh, $200 to $250 um, upgrade. You will need pottery furniture. Pottery furniture consists of shelves, which are these right here, and also stilts that go under the shelves and allows you to stack different layers of your pottery. So if you don't own shelves and you're going to get a kiln, uh, you're going to have to buy some. And for me, it made sense just buying it from the uh, company that I bought the whole setup from. Um, this kiln, as you can see, is about 17 inches wide and it's about 18 inches deep. If you're going to be firing items that are more than say 16 inches wide then you're going to want a bigger kiln. Uh, the way Scut designates their kilns, this is an 818. So if you take a look here it's got eight sides and then that 18 stands for the depth. So if you had a 1027 that would be a 10 sided 27 inch deep kiln. So this is as far as kilns go, this is kind of a smaller kiln, but again, being a hobby potter, uh, this is really all I need. Uh, to fill a big kiln, you really got to make a, be making a lot of stuff. So you can see I've, I've got some items that are going to go in today. These are uh, about eight bowls that I've done, and these things here are going to be used for uh, doing glaze testing. So. I'm going to be doing a bisque firing today, and I'm going to put all this stuff in that kiln. And I'll kind of show you how that goes. So let me show you now what the electrical requirements are for this kiln. Be right back. So for this, I brought you out here to my electrical panel. You could see here that I had a new breaker put in for my kiln. It's 40 amps. Uh, I had room for it, fortunately, so I didn't have to worry about replacing my panel or anything. You can see I had an emergency cutoff put in, so the electrical comes in from behind the panel, comes to this electrical box here, which if we open this up, you'll see if I ever have any problems, or like a fire gets started or something, somebody could run over here and pull this uh, fuse box out so there's a couple of big fuses in there it just gives you kind of another level of safety so this cost me I don't know another 150 bucks or something but I thought it was worth having put in so you can see the conduit goes up I had new wire pulled this is six gauge wire I think you can get away with eight gauge for this thing but um, I put in six in case we ever wanted to upgrade this this is a NEMA 5-50 uh, plug. So if you want to know what plug type is, 
just Google NEMA 5-50 and that's what you got there. This kiln has an option where you can buy it with either 208 or 240 volts. Uh, most residential areas in at least in the state of California and I think mostly in the United States are 240. So if you buy this kiln, you're probably going to want to buy a 240 volt single phase connection. But if you don't know anything about that and you would be confused about it, talk to an electrician before you buy it and have them even come out to your house and make sure you have the capacity for that or that you know what it's going to cost you to, uh, to put the kiln in. Okay, so now I'm going to give you kind of an example of uh, how you would fill this kiln. Again, this is a bisque firing, which is a fire to cone 04. I'm not going to give you the exact degrees, but it's like 1950 or something like that. So again, I told you, you don't put anything directly on the bottom of this kiln. Also, the things that you want to do is every time you use the kiln, you want to vacuum it out because dust is created and you'll get dust on your ceramics. It's especially important to uh, vacuum this thing before you do a glaze firing. So if you're doing a bisque firing, not so much, but if you do a glaze firing and you get pieces of dust on your glaze, then you're not going to get a good product. What you do is you start out with these little tiny um, stilts and what you're going to do is as you stack things up you're going to stack right on top of those stilts. So now I'm going to put the first shelf in. Another thing that you do with your shelves is the first time I fired this kiln I put what's called kiln wash on the shelves and that kiln wash will help keep uh, your ceramics from sticking. So if a little bit of glaze falls off on this shelf, instead of having to chisel it out, you would have an easier time scraping off that glaze. So if you remember, I put my stilts like here, here, and here. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some bowls in here right now. We'll just lay them in like this. Also, you want to be sure that when you put your potter in, you don't get too close to this thermocouple. That's this thing right here. This is sort of your heat sensor. So you don't want anything right on that. So be careful to avoid that thermocouple. Also with a, with a um, bis firing like I'm doing right now, you can stack this stuff because it won't stick. But I don't have that many items, so I'm just going to lay them out like this. So again, I put them kind of right on top of where the other ones were at. So that's right there, over here, and over here. And so here's my second shelf. And some more stilts. There you go. And you want to make sure everything's pretty solid. You don't want it wobbling or anything like that. And now I could put in my last items. Be careful that you don't put anything that's going to come all the way up and touch the top of your kiln. So that's it. You can see I've got everything's at least an inch below the top of the kiln here. And that kiln, I could have put more stuff because I could have stacked it down below. But that, for my purposes, that's pretty, pretty full. So the next step, I'm going to show you how to program it. Very easy, whether you're programming for 
disc firing or glaze firing. And so I'll show you that next. Okay, so now I'm going to show you how easy it is to program. Again, we're going to be doing a bisque firing, which is to cone 04 is what I do. So you can't, you have an option of using this ramp hold mode, which gives you a little more control over how fast or where you, where you want your firing to go if you want to hold it at certain temperatures. But I'm just doing a straight bisque firing. So I'm going to tell my kiln that I want to do a cone fire. It says, do I want to preheat? And I don't. So I'm just going to, I'm just going to say enter here because it had zeros on there. So zero preheat. It says, what cone do you want? You see, last time I did it, I went to cone six. I want to do cone zero four. Now this is the one place people could mess up. If I just did four, Four is a much higher temperature than zero four. So keep your mind about you when you're doing this. You just say zero four and then you say enter. And now it says speed. Do you want to do slow, medium, or fast? Well, if I, again, if my clay was a little bit wet, maybe I would do a slow, a slow firing, which means it would bring the temperature up very slow. My clay is really dry. Uh, I'm just going to do a medium, which is kind of the standard. So again, this is super simple. So I'm going to say medium speed and enter. And then it says hold. That means once it gets up to the temperature that you've set it for, the 04, you want to hold it there. Why well, don't? I just want it to get it to 04 and stop. If you were doing a glaze firing, uh, like I fired to five uh, cone 5 or five cone 6, you might want it to hold at that top temperature for 5, 10, 15 minutes just to make sure your glaze fully matures. But again, for a bisque firing, you don't need to do that. So I'm just going to say no hold. And so now it's ready to go. All I have to do is close the kiln, which I've already done, and hit start. And now it's on. Now if I want to see and you hear that clicking? That's normal. That's what it's supposed to do. Another item I wanted to talk about really quick is um, when you buy a kiln, there's really three or four things you need to think of. One is, do I have the power for it? Does, does my house or wherever I'm putting this have the electrical capabilities to fire my kiln? Now you can buy kilns that take less power, and so maybe you can get around it by that, that way. But if you don't know if your house has what it needs to fire a kiln, then I re recommend talking to an electrician. The other thing you need is a place to fire the kiln. So I use my garage. This garage is probably six or 700 square feet, so it's a nice big room. I also have the ability to open the garage door a little bit which you see i've done here so while it's firing uh clay can put off do what they call off gassing and it's especially noticeable when you do a um when you're doing the um glazes so i leave to to keep the temperature down in the garage and also to get some of that smell out i leave the garage door open a little bit i also can turn a fan on you can buy a venting kit for a kiln. So if I was in a basement or a small room where I was concerned about the off-gassing or the heat, you can put, it's sort of like a, with a, like a dryer duct with a suction on it that will suck that smell and that excess heat out of the room and vent it outside. I didn't need that, so I didn't buy that. The other thing you want to think of when you buy a kiln is uh, how much stuff I'm going to be making and how much I'm going to be firing. Again, I, I mentioned that um, I don't uh, do a huge quantity of items and I don't do really gigantic items. So for me, this interior of about 17 inches wide and 18 inches deep is plenty fine. If you're going to be doing bigger stuff, 
then you're going to want to buy a bigger kiln. Uh, the last thing I think you really need to think of is how hot do I need this kiln to get? If you're only doing, say, like glass fusing or putting like a, they have like a shimmer coat type thing that you can put onto pottery, those require very low temperatures. So you could get away with a, with a kiln that doesn't, uh, doesn't fire to high temperatures. Again, this kiln will fi fire up to, to cone 10, which is very hot. I will probably never fire it that high. But if you think about it, that's kind of a good thing because if you're firing to the max capability of your kiln every time you fire it, the kiln is probably not going to last very long, or at least the elements won't, and you'll be doing a lot more repairs and things like that. So I felt like if I bought a kiln that fires to cone 10 and I'm only firing it to cone 4 for bisking and cone 6 or 04 for bisking and 6 for my glazing that this should last a good long time. Okay so it's been about 25 hours you can see the kilns down to it says 141 degrees the C CPLT means it completed the cycle that I set it for and the 734 is that's how long it took to complete that cycle. So it took 7 hours and 34 minutes for it to get from the ambient temperature in here, which was, was about 55 degrees at the time, up to cone 04, which is about 1950 degrees. And now it's taken another 18 hours from that point to cool back down to 140. So... We're at a point now where it's safe to open the kiln and we can uh, do that without burning our fingers or worrying about uh, something blowing up from the um, severe temperature change. Okay, so here we go. You can see right away that uh, the clay itself has um, turned white. And if I pick a couple of these up and tap them together, you can tell they're they're hard. Turn to like a glass. 